Our time in God's Word today begins in the book of Genesis. It's a great place to begin, yes? This week I realized that in Santa Clarita we have a um, really cool store. It's called Genesis 1. Raise your hand if you know where it is. See, that's cool. Like, oh, it's, you do. Well done. See, because they have some really cool cars there. And you thought this was about women today? Well, it's a man telling the story. So, just going to tell you that Genesis 1 is where they take, they take cars that are older and maybe uh, somewhat valuable, and then they, 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 they turn them into these amazing rocket ships. Yes, it's on railroad. And I was there yesterday, that's why I know. And they have this one car there that is painted this new blue color that looks like tinfoil. Anyone seen those really ritzy cars that they've put a new paint job on that just absolutely shines like tinfoil? Genesis chapter 1 is where we learn that God takes something and he molds it and he makes it and then he sets it out on the earth and he calls it Adam. Adam is given a job right at the very beginning to, let's see if you remember, name the animals. That's very important because of what happens later, but we'll get to that. Adam names all the animals and he starts things off. He starts thinking about what is happening. He thinks with the brain that God has just made. And he goes through all the animals and he finds that there is none like him. And then God said those famous words, ladies, that um, you better have memorized. It is not good, finish it for me, that man should be alone. All right? So anytime he makes you feel like you shouldn't be around, like there's something lesser, just remember, it was from God's mind that he said, it is not good that man should be alone. It wasn't that he modified his plan. I think that he wanted Adam to grow to the place where he knew that he was not yet complete. I know that psychologists today want you to think that you are complete in yourself and that you are just fine by yourself, but I, I'm, I, I'm going to listen to those other psychologists that say that we are also wired for relationship. And I believe that we were wired that way from the very beginning, from the genesis, from the forming. And so God put Adam, I'm going to call him Adam number one, he put Adam number one to sleep. And, uh, you know, all the pastors usually say this, so I'm going to say it. He didn't take a toe bone, ladies. If you feel trodden upon, if you feel put down, if you feel somebody's got their foot on your neck, and it's a man, understand that that is not how God created you to be. He didn't take a piece of Adam's skull, like the top of his head, to indicate that, you know, a woman was going to be above. No, he takes a rib. I don't know about you, but a couple of times when I've been snowboarding, I fell. You catch an edge, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? You catch an edge and boom! I think you fall faster and harder if you snowboard. Snowboarders who make fun of skiers don't want to tell you that because of all the times that they have fallen faster and harder and broken more things. Because it looks so cool to be just carving down the mountain when you're doing it right. But I was coming in to take up a lift, and I wasn't going very fast. And I caught an edge, and my arm was up against my ribs. And at that moment, I fell flat, and my, my arm, I, I think I cracked a rib. I never went to the doctor to find out but it was hard to breathe for about two weeks. A rib 
is what keeps you upright. It keeps your, your, your torso in place. God designed it to be this supportive mechanism. It is, in fact, put together. The, my, my doctor and nurse friends tell me by, uh, I, I love big words. You'll, you'll get that about me, but intercostal. Anyone, anyone know those? When you start working out like I've tried to recently and you stretch, it's those intercostal muscles that get stretched. And that rib, God reaches in. I don't know what he did, whether he had what they call these days a hot knife. Maybe, maybe on the end of his big finger, he just had a hot knife and he reaches in and he pulls out a rib and then he begins to mold and shape that rib. And my friends, out of that rib comes Eve. Now we don't know her name at that time. We don't even know that she's called Woman, these are the two things that happen out of the mouth of Adam. No, Adam. Because God brings this creature that he has created, unnamed. He brings this creature to Adam, and it's Adam's exclamation that comes out of his mouth. It says, whoa, man. <laughs> and so we know you as woman today, uh, <laughs> and there are most of us today who, who are still, when, when we really think about it, when we don't focus on your flaws, when we don't focus on those, those nasty little thoughts sometimes that get in our minds about what you aren't, ladies, when we focus on what you are, I want you to know there is a collective, whoa, man, that just rises up from us guys. Because you are amazing. It's not until later, actually. I actually believe that it's one of the results of sin. Ladies, you'll, you'll forever have to forgive your man for this. But it's after Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden that he treats her just like any one of the other animals. And he names her. It's his first act of dominance. Notice it happens after they leave the Garden of Eden. Because you see, in the beginning, in Genesis, she was pulled from his rib, pulled from his side, because she was to stand by him. She was to be his completion. The two of them together, in the way that they were created, would have with the spark of life that God gives when those Gametes come together and form a zygote. Raise your hand if I've done it right. Did I do it right? I did it right. And a life is begun. This is a miracle, the miracle of life that we see in our families today. It's how the human race gets bigger and bigger every day. But my friends, Man, woman, make, baby makes three. And it's by no mistake that this is the Trinity. Okay? Male and female created he them. That's what it says in Genesis. So don't, don't get upset with the crazy stuff that's going on today. All right? We are... We are purpose-built, we are purpose-designed, and in the fullness of that relationship, life springs forward. Now do with that what you may in the discussions that are being had outside in, the, in, in, in society today, but I just want to affirm women today to say that you were purpose-built, you were not an afterthought, you were not some addendum to man. No, you were part of humanity. So I've called our time together today, woman, uh, humanity's best friend. Now when I was putting this together, I, I thought about the fact that when you think about all the terrible things that have happened in the world, most of them, not all of them, but most of them began with some tyrannical woman. Right, gentlemen? 
say yes and you don't get lunch. Okay? <laughs> no, they began with a man. They began with a man. Okay? And then when we start thinking about some of the amazing things that have happened that have helped humanity, uh, just say a name. Say the name, the first name that pops to your mind. I, I think of Mother Teresa. Say, say another name. Mary Curie. Uh, is it Mary Curie? Madame Curie? Harriet Tubman. Just start saying them. And you come up with an amazing list of ladies who have been at the forefront of doing good things for humanity. Now, is this, is this by mistake? I, I don't think it is. I, I think it's part of the purpose-built nature of women. Now, some, some people want to say, uh, we're both, we're all both, and I believe we are. Because I believe that there are some people who are wired to be more compassionate, there are some people who are wired to be more forceful and more uh, dominant, if you like. And, and you, it, it doesn't matter what gender you are, these traits can come forward in this day and age when you are allowed, in many respects, to be whomever you would like to be. We encourage, in fact, we encourage people to be whomever they would like to be. But today, I would like to add one layer because we are sitting in church before God. And we are saying to ourselves, women and men are purpose-built. And I'm going to say, I would also encourage you to ask God who you were meant to be. In the conversations that go on in our schools and in our uh, work uh, places, these are thoughts that have their genesis in the minds of individuals. I'm going to say, why don't you use your influence under the Spirit of God, why don't you use your influence to just remind people that God didn't do this as a mistake. God didn't make us the way we are because he was thinking something different. He did it on purpose. So that means that we as human beings will need to be compassionate, We'll need to be understanding, we'll need to be helpful, and we'll need to be pointing people to Jesus. I'm going to leave it there because I believe that he will inspire you in the moment. He has promised to give you the words to speak of compassion, the words of love, the words that come from him that will help the next person next to you, no matter who they are, to understand this concept that from Adam number one, came a wife who then he named Eve and said, you will be the mother of all living. So today we honor mothers, and I believe that it's a good thing that as a church we also honor women. Gentlemen, next month it's your turn. There are two women that exemplify Proverbs 31. Now, my wife said, hey, everybody knows Proverbs 31, but maybe not everybody does, and maybe not every one of us remember Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, I mean, by the way, gentlemen, if your wife knows Proverbs 31, or if your, your, your friend knows 30, 30, and you tell her, Darling, you're a Proverbs 31 woman. You get a lot of points for that. Okay? I just want you to know, if they know what you're talking about, but if they don't know what you're talking about, how can they know that this is a huge compliment? This is a, let, me, let, me just, let me just think, let, let me just remind you of, of, of what was said. For example, she goes out and buys a field. She considers a field and she buys it. So she's, she's not only good at business, but she has a good business sense. Okay? And she, she accomplishes what she, she goes out. Her family doesn't have to worry in the wintertime. Well, your family lives in California, so you just thought that yesterday and today were cold. Well, I've got news for you. Uh, it's not that way in Calgary, Alberta. Okay? 
and you have to know that your family has a parka. Well, in the, in the Bible times, they, they did things with wool. So you hear a number of, of, of references to the making of clothes. The distaff. What's a distaff? Well, it's, it's a spindle. People used to have to spin their own yarn, and then they would dye it, and then they would weave it, and then they would make clothes out of it. They couldn't go down to Walmart and buy already made fabric in whatever configuration and pattern they wanted. They had to make it all from scratch, and she made it all from scratch. This, this woman is industrious. It says that her light doesn't go out in the evenings because she's spinning. She's sitting by the fireside listening to her husband tell about what went on at the gate. Understand this is a metaphor at the gate of the city was where all the legal and, and, and business stuff took place and he is an honored man at the gate and part of what honors him is his wife. It, is, it also mentions, if you care to look at it, that it mentions that she brings honor to her father. Yes, this is the Bible. Yes, this is Israelite times. Yes, this is the society in which a woman had to be attached to a man to have legal status. I don't know, ladies. Some say the glass ceiling has been broken. But I bet if we had to have a testimony time, a, a come-to-Jesus moment right now, you would probably have stories to tell about how you have been held back in our society in 2017 because you're a woman. So that old way of doing things that has come from Bible times is still in existence today and there is not the equality that we find in Genesis with the beginning time where Eve stands beside Adam. There's not that kind of equality since we rebelled as a human race. First Eve, and then Adam choosing to do things differently. Well, it's been very different from what God intended. Very different. This woman is, is uh, someone who, who, as I said, brings glory to her husband and also brings glory to the father. She is valued above the price of rubies. Rubies in, in, in both Bible times and today are semi-precious stone. They say semi-precious. I am one who believes that there are less, if you go by what's lesser in the world, that there are less rubies than there are diamonds. So, you know, which one should be precious and which one should be semi-precious? I, I'd like to throw one at my friends in South Africa and say diamonds are not a girl's best friend. Uh, I told my daughter that, and she listened. She told her husband, I don't want a diamond, husband-to-be, and he bought her a garnet instead. I was proud of that, because we don't know where those diamonds come from, and we don't know what lives were spent to get them. Just understand that today, and I say that to my friends in South Africa, because De Beers has a monopoly in this world, my friends, and don't believe that they don't have piles and piles of diamonds in Antwerp just waiting to be cut when the market demands. So I told her to get something else, and she listened. The Bible says, though, that a woman's price, this, this Proverbs 31 woman, is above that of rubies. It's, it, it, it's inestimable in many ways. And so, in our society today, I hope that we can grab a hold of this concept, gentlemen particularly, I hope we can grab a hold of this and realize that the honor that we may be receiving in society today is in large part due to the wholeness of the family unit. And that we, if we really were to be honest, gentlemen, would know that we would not be the people we are today if it wasn't for the women in our lives. Our mothers, our sisters, the people that we work with who have a perspective that we benefit from. I want to branch out now from uh, this particular verse and take us to 
a concept in the Adventist church that we talk about as the second Adam. Okay? We talk about the fact that Jesus came to reclaim the kingship of this world, which the first Adam voluntarily gave up. So I want to introduce this thought to you because I'm going to use Jesus as a new name, and his name is Adam number two. So you have Adam one and Adam two, because I want you to see maybe a little bigger picture of Proverbs 31 today. Adam number two comes along, and he needs or has, has need of a spouse, if you want to think of it that way. And in Scripture, we can see, especially in Psalm 87, did you notice that there was talk like of that towards a woman? There was talk about a number of cities. Tyre. Then it says, but you were born in Zion. I want to just bring this concept to you today because I believe that the larger the larger idea that we can grab a hold of includes all of us here today. It's called the church. If you think of in your mind the fact that cities in the Bible are always thought of as groups of people. So if you have this group of people that is special to God, that is special to the one who would come, that is talked about actually in Revelation as the wife of the Lamb, the bride of the Lamb, then Adam number two, Jesus Christ, brings together, is, is brought together in Scripture with his bride, the church, Zion, Jerusalem. This becomes a symbol for all of us as far as including all of us in what we're talking about today. If then we apply this to Proverbs 31, and say that the woman that's being talked about in Proverbs 31 is the church. Not just a woman or a wife. But now the wife of, or the, 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 the love, how, how, shall, how shall we say this gentlemen, the love interest of God himself. The, the person, the, the person for whom he is willing to lay down his life. We read in, in Scripture that Jesus is willing to lay down his life for his people. Now, his people are those who claim him. He says it's the whole world. Unfortunately, those that accept what he has to offer, what he proposes, which is to be his people, those who accept will be few. There will be many who say, I don't want to be part of that group. I, I feel sorry for those people today, especially as I look at Proverbs 31. Because wouldn't it, church, church wouldn't it be great for people to think of church in the same way as Proverbs 31. They're industrious. They don't eat the bread of idleness. They're busy. They're doing what is necessary in order that their family be taken care of. See, when we make this a broader thing, this, this uh, next week when we house individuals in this church who are homeless and we participate with an organization that is trying to spin them back up into society, we are doing what's talked about in Proverbs 31. In Proverbs 31 it says that the woman opens her arms to the poor. The needy find help at her door. So if you, can, if you can just catch a hold of this for a moment, I think that, 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 that Scripture will help you today to realize that on this Mother's Day, on this Woman's Day, that we can realize that women, or the concept of the woman, the church, 
is man's best friend. It's the best friend of humanity. Because you see, Jesus, Jesus left physically, and he told his disciples, I will send you the comforter, otherwise known as the Holy Spirit, my spirit. And together, the comforter, the spirit, and the church together do exactly what is talked about in Proverbs 31 for the rest of the world who just don't know. They are poor in knowledge. They are needy in spirit. Does that make any sense today? I'm going to credit my wife for making a lot of these connections. The mind of a woman. It's a mysterious thing. Two ladies, I told you. One of them is Zipporah. Funny name, hey? Sounds like zipper. Zipporah is the daughter of Reul, who is a shepherd, but he is also a priest. We also know him, I believe, as Jethro. He is the Midianite high priest. Moses ends up running away from Egypt and he ends up in Midian and he ends up at a well because you've got to have water when you're in the desert and there Zipporah and her sisters are trying to water their sheep. They don't have brothers so there's no man to do a man's work and so in come the sisters and the sisters become the shepherdesses. Now, the other shepherds, men, would bully them. Sad, but true. They would push them away, and they would make their flocks wait until last, until all their flocks were drinking was the muddy, leftover water from what their sheep had. It's not a, not a happy story, but like every good superhero, uh, having been trained in the martial arts of Egypt... Moses to the rescue. Moses comes forward. Moses steps in, and uh, he probably had a staff, you know, so he's probably one of these guys who knows how to wield his staff. Moses comes in and chases away these villainous shepherds and allows Zipporah and her sisters to water their sheep. Well, she's, she's a little shy, it would seem, because she goes home with her sheep and leaves, Mo leaves Moses at the well. Well, her dad is amazed at the story that's just been told and realizes this is no ordinary individual and that he needs to make an alliance with him as quickly as possible. And so he tells Zipporah, go back to the well and bring this guy home for supper, please. True a Middle Eastern hospitality, bring him under my roof because under my roof he has my protection. After dinner he, he talks to him and we don't know how long it took. The Bible isn't very clear about that but I, I'm going to imagine that it didn't take very long for him to make a deal with Moses uh, after learning about what had happened <laughs> and he offers him Zipporah. Now we'll just gloss over the fact that dads were able to just give their daughters away without their permission. That, that's part of the society in those days. But he gives Zipporah to Moses and Moses becomes the head of the shepherding department. I'm believing too though that Zipporah was also involved. They have a family. And it's not until Moses is leading the people out of Egypt that he calls for, he sends a message to his family, you can now come and join me. So no, Zipporah and the boys did not go to Egypt and did not experience the, the, the ten plagues. They did not experience that whole situation. They join him later. Along that way, 
God comes along and reminds Moses that he has forgotten a very important covenantal peace. The boys have not been circumcised. The boys have not borne the, the sign of connection to God that God has dictated for his people. And he's coming for Moses. It is Zipporah, though, that throws herself into the middle, into the middle between God and Moses, and she breaks out a knife and she circumcises her children. The wrath of God recedes and they are spared. This is the kind, this is the kind of woman that is talked about in Proverbs 31. Someone who is willing to open her arms to the needy. Someone who is willing to take care of her family. Someone who is willing to lay down her life. Another great love story, of course, is the, the story of Isaac who sent his manservant Eliezer to his uncle's house. Now, you've got to learn the story. If you don't know the story, please read it this afternoon. Isaac needs a wife, and he decides to go back to his people to find one. Eliezer concocts a plan that is similar to the story of Zipporah. He goes and he says, God, please show me. Show me who it needs to be for my master Isaac. And he too ends up at the well. Strange that it is always a well, but when you have animals, that's the focal point of keeping them alive. He gets there and Rebecca is watering her animals. She, out of the kindness and generosity of her soul, it was who she was, offers to water his camels, which is a long process. Have you ever seen a camel drink? It takes a while, and you have to bring up a lot of earthenware jars. He goes and asks her in a very, very good way uh, for this weekend, gentlemen, take note of what Eliezer does. He comes with gifts, and he gives her some very expensive jewelry. It's significant jewelry, and then she runs home and she tells her brother, Laban, and he says, what? And you left him at the well? Ladies, please. We, we need you to take a little more initiative here. I, and I know that some of you have. Some of you older ones know what Sadie Hawkins did to this world. And we're glad for it. We're glad for it. Some of you know that you had to take the initiative with your husband. He wasn't picking up what you were laying down. I like you, you know. And maybe you had to do some of the asking. That's okay. Probably was a little better than Zipporah and Rebecca, leaving the guy at the well. You know what I'm saying? So they, they bring Eliezer in. They have a big meal. They make a deal. And a few days, weeks, Later, Eliezer and, and, and his camel caravan leave, leave that old part of the history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Mesopotamia and make the trek back to where his master Isaac is living. Now Isaac doesn't know who Eliezer is going to bring back. To the children here, to the young people here, to those who are hoping to be married... How much trust do you have in your mom or your dad to help you choose someone? I hope you do. Uh, and, and moms and dads, I, I, I hope you are, are taking this very, 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 very seriously. The encouragement that we need to give to our kids today. I was, I, I was speaking with Isaac uh, earlier today, and, and uh, as in our Isaac, the one that is a member here, and he, he, uh, he has lots of kids. And we want all of them to know that to marry a person who is a Jesus-focused person is probably one of the most important choices that they will make. It's what we told my daughter, and it's what we tell my son. Don't care who you marry. And that might be a scary thing to say. 
But, and this was the one thing, they have to be a Jesus boy or a Jesus girl. Because this family is going to heaven. That's what I told them. And we want everybody, we want everybody to go with us. We want everybody to want to go with us. So please understand, moms, dads, if you want to live forever with your family, let's keep us together focused on Jesus. Let's keep us together as the bride of Adam number two. That's what, that's what, that's what he did for us. He, he made a way, he made a way for whoever will, that's what he says, whoever wants to be part of my family, whoever wants to be known as the bride of Christ, I will lay down my life for anyone and everyone. So on this Mother's Day, on this Woman's Day, as we've expanded it today, on this day when we have, in fact, I believe, the church in focus, let's realize that the bridegroom says, women, humanity's best friend. Amen? Amen.